Are your unit tests broken or slowing you down? In this video, I'm going to talk about four common mistakes that I've seen people make over the years when it comes to them writing unit tests. Some of the mistakes are ones that I've made as well. Actually, all of them are mistakes that I've made. And by the end of this video, you'll have a better idea of how to write more scalable unit tests, regardless of what programming language you use. So if you're excited for that, be sure to smash the like button and let's get into it. The first mistake that you might be making is you're testing the implementation of your code as opposed to the behavior of your code. One of the main reasons why you want to write unit tests is to be able to easily refactor your code and know that the behavior did not break. But if you are testing the implementation, then you can't refactor the code because if the implementation changes, then the unit test is going to fail. However, if you treat all of your unit tests like black boxes where you send input in and you get something out of that and you're asserting on that output of the function or the class, then you can rewrite all of the internals. And as long as the input and output remain the same, then you know that you haven't done anything that broke that code. Some things to watch out for when it comes to not testing the internals is you normally want to see a test that is asserting different things. So this will be like, given this function, when I put two plus two in, then I'm asserting that it's equal to four. If on the other hand, you see things like verifications taking place or you're checking a mock to make sure that some function was executed, that usually turns into something where you are verifying the internals work, you're verifying that functions were called, that's where you start to get into some trouble. Not to say that you can never do that, but the majority of your tests should be asserting that something was equal to something else, as opposed to verifying that functions were being called with given parameters. The next mistake that I've seen is tests not failing. So no matter what you do, the test will never fail, it just always passes. This might sound like a really good thing. I mean, if the tests always pass, then you never have to go back and fix what's broken, but you really want your tests to fail because again, going back to refactoring your code and knowing that the behavior is still the same, even though the underlying code changed, if they never fail, you'll never have that certainty that the rewrite actually worked. The best way to know that your test will fail is to start off by writing a test that does fail. The easiest way to do that is to practice test-driven development where you write the test first, you get a little bit of the function in there and it just returns some default value and essentially it's going to fail. So you write that test, make sure it fails, then you update your code so that the test now passes and then you can do any sort of refactoring that you want to make the code cleaner, make it more performant or whatever you want to do. If you're not quite ready to do test room development though, another thing that I will do is I will just make the function obviously fail. So I'll just write some code that makes it fail and then validate that the test that I just wrote fails and then just revert the change so then it goes back to passing. Another mistake that I've encountered are tests that just aren't clear. It's really difficult to know what is going on. The issue there is when the test fails and most likely it'll fail in a CI environment where you have a little bit less ability to know like, why is this test failing? But when you go to figure out what's going on, you look at the class or the test function and you just go, whoa, I have no idea what's going on because it's just a bunch of spaghetti code. It's not structured very well. There's multiple tests within the single test. And so then it takes something that should be pretty easy to understand why the test failed and what you need to update. Now you have to go and debug the test itself to figure out what's going on. It is pretty easy to overcome though. What I found is writing function names that make sense, being verbose with those function names as well. So don't feel like you need to write a function that's less than 20 characters. If anything, you're gonna be writing a function that has like 20 words in it, but you really wanna be as exact and precise as possible. That way when the test fails, you know exactly what happened. The naming pattern that I use is just given when then. For the given part, it's just really documenting what is the current state of the system while this unit test is running. When, that's going to say like what function is being called, what values are being passed into that function, and then the then is what behavior do I expect to see from this test? So given when then, those are kind of the three words that you can use to figure out 
how to write the function name and then kind of add in descriptors after each one of those words. I also like to break up the test function in three clear segments. So the first one is the given segment. It's essentially the test setup, making sure that the system is in the right state for the test. Next section is the when. So essentially just calling the function that I want to test and then getting the value back. And then the then statement is just asserting on the behavior. So most of the time I will have a single assertion. Sometimes I might need to write a couple assertions around the return value. The important thing to keep in mind though is after each step, you don't have any other code that would be a part of that step. What I mean by that is if you have the then portion, you're calling the function and getting the value. After you've asserted on the return value, you are never calling that function again. That would be its own test. Now, sometimes you might want to test multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And for that, most unit test frameworks have something called parameterized tests where you have an input parameter and an output parameter, and it will run through the exact same setup and the exact same assertions, just with different inputs and outputs in that when block. And then perhaps the biggest mistake that you can make when writing unit tests is not running those tests automatically as a part of your build process. Tests are really only valuable when they're ran on a regular basis. And if you don't automate them, you're not gonna run them every single time. And so you might go and check the unit tests a month after the fact and then realize, hey, the test framework actually doesn't even run anymore. Or now I'm seeing like 10 different failures. I don't know when those failures were introduced. If you're running them on a constant basis, as soon as a test fails, you know what code changed that caused that to fail because it should be the code that's up for PR or the code that was just merged into the main branch. But if you're never running them, you may as well not write the tests at all. This is actually something where for like automated end-to-end -end tests or automated UI tests, one of the first things I always look at is, okay, what are we gonna do to run these automatically? And if we can't, then we shouldn't even invest the time in writing them. Unit tests, they're generally pretty easy to run on an automated basis, whether you're using CircleCI, GitHub Actions, GitLab, whatever CI provider you're using, you're gonna be able to find a plethora of examples for running unit tests and having the CI job fail if any of those tests fail. If you are writing unit tests correctly, they should not be making your life miserable. If anything, they should be making your life much easier, much simpler, because you're documenting the behavior, you're able to change code without breaking anything. And something I didn't mention in this video, but if you encounter a bug, you can then replicate that bug with the unit test and then verify that the test fails, update the code, make sure that it passes. And the sweet thing about that is it'll run all of the other unit tests so you can make sure that the bug fix doesn't introduce a regression, which is always nice to see. And if you wanna improve even more as a programmer, I recommend checking out this video next. It'll walk through seven common mistakes that programmers make and how to fix them. That's it, that's the video.